Okay. Okay, we're live. Um, welcome, everybody. We're so excited to invite Isabella Hamad to the DC PFAS this year, um, part of a sort of focus on literature we're doing. Um, and I think we'll just dive right in uh, as people sort of filter in to today's talk. I'm going to introduce her. So Isabella Hamad was born in London and lives between London and New York, although she's currently in Athens. Um, <laughs> her first novel, The Parisian, won a 2019 Palestine Book Award, the 2020 Sue Kaufman Prize from the American Academy of Arts and Letters, and a Betty Trask Award for the Society of Authors in the UK. She's also awarded the 2018 Plimpton Prize for Fiction and a 2019 O. Henry Prize for her short story, story Mr. Kenan. And in 2019, she was a National Book Foundation Five Under 35 honoree. And she's currently at work on a new novel set in London and Palestine. Um, and so we're gonna start today's uh, program with just a reading from, two short readings from the work. Uh, and I'll let you, you take it away. Thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. And uh, thank you for having me from afar. So I'm sorry I can't be that person, but this is life uh, for now. Um, so I'm going to read two sections from the Parisian, um, and I'm going to start at the very beginning. There was one other Arab on board the ship to Marseille. His name was Farouk al-Azmi. And the day after leaving port in Alexandria, he approached Midhat at breakfast with a plate of toast in one hand and a string of amber prayer beads in the other. He sat, tugged at the cuffs of his shirt and started to describe without any introduction how he was returning from Damascus to resume his teaching post in the language department of the Sorbonne. He had left Paris at the outbreak of war, but after the miracle of the Marne was determined to return. He had gray eyes and a slightly rectangular head. Beris, he sighed, it is where my life is. To young Midhat Kamal, this statement was highly suggestive. In his mind, a gallery of lamps directly illuminated a dance hall full of women. He looked closely at Farouk's clothes. He wore a pale blue three-piece suit and an indigo tie with a silver tie pin in the shape of a bird. A cane of some dark unpainted wood leaned against the table. I am going to study medicine, said Midhat, at the University of Montpellier. Bravo, said Farouk. Midhat smiled as he reached for the coffee pot. Muscles he had not known were tense began to relax. This is your first visit to France, said Farouk. Midhat said nothing, assenting. Five days had passed since he said goodbye to his grandmother in Nablus and travelled by mule to Tulkarem, where he joined the Haifa line for Kantara East and changed trains for Cairo. After a few days at his father's house, he boarded the ship in Alexandria. He had become accustomed to the endless skin of the water, broken by white crests, flashing silver at noon. Lunch was at one, tea was at four, dinner was at 7.30. And at first he sat alone watching the Europeans eat with their knives. He developed a habit of searching a crowded room for the red hair of the captain, a Frenchman named Gorin and after dinner would watch him enter and exit the bridge where he supervised the helm. Yesterday he started feeling lonely. It happened suddenly. Sitting beside the stern waiting for the captain, he became conscious of his back against the bench, a sensation that was bizarrely painful. He was aware of his legs extending from his pelvis. His nose, usually invisible, doubled and intruded on his vision. The outline of his body weighed on him as a hard, sore shape, and his heart beat very fast. He assumed the feeling would pass, but it did not, and that evening, simple interactions with the quartermaster, dining attendants, other passengers, took on a strained and breathless quality. It must be obvious to them, he thought, how raw his skin felt. During the night, he pressed the stem of his pocket watch compulsively in the dark, lifting the lid on its pale face. The ticking lulled him to sleep. Then he woke a second time and, continuing to check the hour as the night progressed, began to see in those twitching hands the spasms of something monstrous. It was with a strong feeling of relief, therefore, and a sense that his sharp outline had softened slightly that he smiled back at his new friend. What do you imagine it will be like, said Farouk? Imagine what, France? 
Before I came the first time, I had many pictures of it in my mind. Some turned out to be quite accurate in the end. Some were, he pinched his lips and smiled. For some reason, I had an idea about wigs, you know, the false hair. I'm not sure where I got it from. Possibly I had seen an old drawing. Mithat made a sound like he was thinking and looked through the window at the sea. His high school in Constantinople was modelled on the French lycée. The textbooks were all French imports, as were half the teachers and even most of the furniture. Midhat and his classmates had sat on ladderback chairs with woven rush seats, reading La Poésie et Pique en Grèce, memorising the names of elements in a mixture of French and Latin. And only when the bell rang did they slip into Turkish and Arabic and Armenian in the corridor. Once formulated in French, certain concepts belonged in French, so that, for instance, Midhat knew the names of his internal organs as le poumon and le coeur and le cerveau and l'encephale, and understood philosophical abstractions by their French names, l'altruisme, la condition humaine. And yet, despite being steeped for five years in all things French, he struggled to conjure a picture of France that was separate from the furnishings of his classrooms, whose windows had displayed a hot Turkish sky and admitted shouts of Arabic from the water. Even now, from the vantage of this ship, Provence remained hidden by fog and the earth's unseeable curves. He looked back at Farouk. I cannot imagine it. He waited for Farouk's scorn, but Farouk only shrugged and dropped his eyes to the table. And then um, Mithat goes to Montpellier and enrolls in the um, medical faculty um, and falls in love um, with the daughter of his... Um, sorry, I need to find that. Um, the daughter of his uh, his host, uh, a French sociologist called Dr. Molyneux. And at the end of the first part, he um, discovers that the family doesn't really see him as an equal um, and uh, he's very upset about it. So he leaves and goes to Paris where he falls in with a group of Syrian nationalists and exiles, Syria at that time, including uh, Palestine and Lebanon and um, Transjordan. Um, and when he goes back to Palestine at the end of the First World War, it's under British control, under the British mandate. Britain and France have um, started their um, colonial projects in the Middle East, basically. Um, and in the passage I'm going to read next, the year is 1920, and um, Prince Faisal has announced, or kind of, yeah, he's announced uh, an independent Syrian kingdom of which he is the king in defiance of the French mandate, even though they don't have an army or anything to back it up. And the Palestinians are um, going to march to Jerusalem to show their support for the, friend, for the Syrian kingdom and they're calling themselves Southern Syrians. So Midhat now is on a train with his cousin Jamil um, and uh, that's all you need to know. So go on. Over the next three hours, Midhat fell into a daydream. He thought of what Hani had said in his letter about naming themselves Syrians and wondered what might happen next. Perhaps a war of independence, which would do what to Nablus? He already knew how wartime could suspend the normal rules. It might free him from his father's command. Syria would be free, and so would Midhat. Jamil met his eye and winked. The mountains beyond the window interrupted the sunlight, sculpting his cousin's cheekbones with their moving shade. Beyond him, the foreign women hunched on the benches. And where would that freedom lead? Teta was right. He did not know what he wanted. His tableau vivant of King Faisal ruling Palestine lapsed into a vision of himself in Cairo, married with small children. He tried to work out where this image had come from and was bewildered to realise that he was imagining himself married to Layla. The echo of a drum fought discordantly with the rhythm of the crankshaft. In English, a woman cried, there are so many people. The window was filled with heads and flags. The roar reached them dimly, like a waterfall across a canyon. Midhat put an arm across Jamil to let the women alight first. Several thanked him, and as he bowed and lifted his tarbouche, Jamil hit him on the chest with the back of his hand and laughed. Stepping down was like stepping into a thundercloud. Michael, isn't that the Hebron procession? shouted an Englishman in a boater. I thought they weren't coming for an hour yet. They followed the crowd towards the old city. One smug-looking tarbouche was carrying a gramophone above his head, but its music was inaudible. The crowd thickened and slowed, and a horse appeared by the roadside, bearing a stout man with a small block of a moustache. Ya comrades, 
his chins distended. Behave peacefully, ya comrades. At Jaffa Gate, they came to a stop behind a group of young European men refusing to go further. Midhat took Jamil by the arm. We're going in? Of course, he shouted, and plunging through the group, released Jamil's arm to clap, borne along under the arch of the gate. The Europeans had moved to one side, and as the parade bent to fit through the entrance, Midhat saw that its tail was made up of Arab women. Many carried banners and placards like the men, a few even waved Sharifian flags. They were shouting something. Falastin Aradna was the first phrase. He could not make out the second. All at once, the crush overtook them, and as they were impelled under the vault into the open air on the other side, stay with me, said Mithat, snatching his cousin's sleeve. They saw more women on the balconies above, throwing coloured handkerchiefs down onto their heads. By a group of drummers, a Sufi dervish in a long gown and jacket of balding velveteen began to dance. His body talked, first one way and then the other, so his garments spun out and the seams twisted. He rocked his head back and forth, patting the ground with his feet. Dust rose in a mist. The crush became an audience, dilating the space around him. A clap started, then one song caught over the discordance of the many and spread around their area. And as someone pushed him closer to the dervish, Midhat lost his hold on Jamil. The dancer's feet patted faster, faster, and Midhat stepped close enough to hear the man's own voice. La ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah. Then something unexpected happened. Half propped up by people on either side, Midhat experienced a strange, dull explosion in his chest. Something close to joy, but deeper, more serene. He moved his head to the pulse, his tongue ticked against his hard palate. Unable to see the dervish's feet, Midhat watched him revolving with mechanical smoothness, motored by the turbines of his tensed, upstretched wrists. A hand clasped his neck. Is everything all right? Jamil's hair was matted, his forehead shining, a scum filmed his upper lip. Look, look, Dubki! The dervish gave way to a line of village men, grasping elbows and hopping up and down. One at a time, they shuffled to the centre of the vacated ring and jumped and kicked. From somewhere, pipes. Midhat looked down at his own legs. His shoes were pale with dust. He felt a shove from behind. You know, Dubki. No, I don't. He gasped at laugh and pushed back. The group of women at the rear had moved under the arch, and as the crowd compacted, they settled by the wall and clapped along. One woman near the front, who was not clapping, caught Midhat's attention. She was looking directly at him, staring, in fact, and standing very still. He tried to keep her level in his sight while everyone else jostled, then knew she had detected him because she quickly turned away. She remained in absolute profile, motionless. Without even thinking of Jamil, Midhat pushed towards her, Although she did not move her head, he could see the white corner of her eye go black with her turning iris. Without the other eye, the single organ was like an object, and he did not have the feeling of meeting someone's gaze. Instead, he was, looking, he was watching her looking at him. A body blocked his view. He pressed against the next person along to take the woman into his sight again, provoking a knock on his shoulder as the dancing circle closed in on itself. The crowd began to shift. The horde of waiting pilgrims by the gate plunged towards him, and then she turned. He caught her, Fat Muhammad, both eyes, the downward slope at the corners, and though he could not see the rest of her face, the eyes were enough to summon the whole. There you go. Thank you so much. Um, there was so much just in those two small passages of quite a long and detailed book. Um, and I guess we'll just start with our questions um, for you. And I also want to, as I'm speaking to Isabella, I want to encourage the audience to ask questions. You can click on the play bar and, and go to YouTube and leave a comment or a question, which we'll try to address. Um, so Isabella, tell me, we'll just start with a very simple question. I'd love to hear more about Midhat. Like where did his story come from? Why choose this person's perspective to focus on? I noticed that Fatima, you know, she shares the last name with you, but I'd love to just hear more about those two. Yeah, so he's he's based on um, he's based on my great grandfather, who um, partly raised my dad, um, and um, that's him there. Um, <laughs> so I actually grew up with a picture of him, not this one. There's another picture of him where he's standing in front of. Um, uh, well, I mean, he's kind of, he looks like he's out on a stroll and he's wearing his tarbush and he's got a kind of wax moustache and he's carrying a pair of leather gloves. 
and uh, there's a sort of boulevard behind him. And this picture <laughs> sort of all over my, you know, every family member has a copy of this photograph. And so I always thought of him as Alberici, he's the Parisian in Nablus. He sort of studied in France and is sort of obsessed with sort of silk scarves or whatever. Um, and I always imagined him out on a walk in Paris. And, and then only years later did I look at this photograph and it's actually in a, a painted screen in Jerusalem. It was in a studio in Jerusalem. Oh, wow. But this was the kind of, I know it's funny. It was like, it was funny that I was so familiar with this photograph and I'd never looked at it properly, you know. But it was, that you know, I grew up with this idea of this man, basically this very eccentric um, man who was very lovable and slightly ridiculous. And I, um, you know, obviously growing up in the diaspora, the main other stories you hear about Palestine are kind of, uh, you know, tragic stories. And I, um, and I, I wanted to match up the story of the of the bon vivant, the kind of ridiculous midhat, with the stories um, uh, of life in Palestine, um, the beginnings of the national struggle before the Nakba. Um, and the stories I've been told about him, and they were mostly kind of funny anecdotes. Um, and then the more I uncovered, I, the more I understood he's actually incredibly sensitive and um, that his life was quite complicated, um, and particularly his relationship with women and with his mother um, and so on, his absent mother. And so Fatima is the woman he marries in the end, sort of a giveaway that she's got my second name. Um, uh, and, uh, and that's her there. But those are her down slope, downward sloping eyes. Um, and uh, and yeah, so I, I set out to write a book basically based on their lives, based on the cat's life. And um, so you mentioned that you sort of uncovered so much more about this this person. Um, and I would love to hear you talk about that process because obviously the book is this combination of family history and so much detail, and then also really detailed secondary research on what Nablus was like, what France was like, the politics of the time. And then in addition to that, the sort of, um, as you say, he was more sensitive character. I mean, how did you sort of under, come to understand that? Yeah, I mean, the main kind of, I began with um, oral histories. I mean, I just spent a lot of time with elderly relatives. I interviewed my grandmother a lot, my grandmother, um, uh, is a very very good storyteller and can talk for hours you know so she's kind of she's like um she was the probably the most the, the the principal source for material that actually went into the book so i would often there were, there were anecdotes of hers or stories of hers that i kind of lifted wholesale most of the other people i i more felt like i was kind of gathering ambient information um and i and i spent a lot of time with kind of elderly people in nablus maybe they didn't even know mid hat or and all over the place and you know with refugees and um also with historians and scholars of different kinds, I just felt like I was trying to um, uh, create a kind of a, a space in which I could imagine that period with as much, with kind of maximum material and psychological realism as I could achieve. I also feel like that experience was its own thing. Well, you know, it's sort of related to writing the book, but it also was its own kind of growth period for me as well, um, spending a lot of time with elderly people and just talking about the history of Palestine and their experiences and their childhood memories. Um, and from it, you know, obviously I then wrote the book, but it, it wasn't, it was, those, those processes are quite unconscious or kind of quite, yeah. um, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't like an academic um, process. Right. Um, and then obviously I did a lot of uh, obsessive historical research and kind of harassing historians and stuff. So. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm sure they loved it. Um, the, uh, the, so to that point of like a sort of unconscious psychological um, uh, dimension. I was wondering if you kind of understand or can talk about how much of yourself is in the character of Nidhat or any of the other characters in the book, because he is this person that's really trapped between two kind of spaces in the world, two geographies, two cultures and languages. And I know a lot of Palestinians, including myself in diaspora or from families, um, can, can, in, can really relate to that experience of being kind of both part of two places and also kind of on the outside always. Um, so how much of that came from your own experience? Definitely, I mean, I wouldn't say that I kind of, I think I, it was more observations of my male family members. I don't know if it's that they experience it differently, but I, 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 ne I, inevitably all of your characters have pieces of you in and that's just the case because in order to access this other, uh, realm of experience with other consciousness that you've created or are trying to access you have to use some of your own emotional experience or kind of material in order to kind of make that empathetic jump mm -hmm. um 
but but I mean, I think the themes are very, very dear to me. Like the themes are obviously very important growing up uh, in two cultures, growing up in diaspora. Um, what that means about kind of your your relation to Palestine, your kind of um, to being Palestinian. Um, but I think uh, I think that particularly for the my parents' generation, um, I think the question of um, assimilating or not sort of maybe more critical. I think that that period is more difficult to be Palestinian diaspora um, in some respects. Uh, and I think that is something that I grew up very conscious of and confused by and I uh, was probably investigating. I think, in the yeah. Um, uh, so back to something you were saying before, your sort of main person you were relying on for the story was Peta Arada. And um, I noticed that there's a lot of Arabic in the book, but the only actual Arabic script is in your um, dedication. And it says, um, So I have to ask, I mean, obviously she gave you so much rich detail. Uh, can you share with us maybe an example of that? Uh, one of your favorite Tafasil? She was so, uh, yeah, she was sort of signing at the launch in London. She was signing. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, well, one that kind of went wholesale in there was the story of Rada and the funerals. You know, mm -hmm. that when she was a little girl, that she would follow the funerals, the hands in the third part of the novel. That I kind of, when she was telling me that story, I was like, oh, it's going in straight away. Um, but there were lots of stories. You know, she loved her father so much, and I, and and she loved his kind of sense of style and his he's so sweet, he was kind of like white-hearted man. Um, so a lot of her love for him, I kind of felt I kind of was putting mm -hmm. into the book. Yeah. Um, so, and, and then another thing that's probably interesting for our audience is, is you said you, you interviewed people in Nablus and was that the sort of only time you visited Nablus or not the only time, rather the first time you visited Nablus was for this research? Yeah. So I kind of, I sort of went the first time after university and then I go okay. every year. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Yeah, so I guess from that, I was curious, uh, did you go to Nablus for the first time and start doing these oral histories with the novel in mind already? And if so, how did this trip like influence or change the trajectory of your novel or did it, you know? Yeah, I mean, I I think on the one hand, I definitely want, I mean, I went because I wanted to write, work to write and, um, mm -hmm. and I wanted to find out about Mithat specifically and Nablus in general, Nablus is kind of like a character. Yeah. Uh, but I, I mean, you know, I was like really young and I didn't, I, I think that in retrospect, you can always, you can come through a straight line of like motivation to action. And I think that it was much murkier than that. And I think it's a very like emotional experience and kind of uh, confusing and um, uh, life changing in some ways to kind of uh, go through that very sped up learning period. Um, but I did, I mean, I was, I did from, you know, the moment I got there, I was like interviewing people. I, I mean, I wasn't really sure what I was looking for specifically. You know, my grandmother was just kind of lining up members of the command family. <laughs> She's writing a history of Nablus, which was not really worth it, you know, kind of. <laughs> so it was kind of exploratory and slightly ad hoc and um, uh, improvisatory, I think would say. Um, mm -hmm. but, um, but I did go for that, for that express purpose, yes. That's interesting. And uh, so you interviewed members of your family and others, and I, I want to ask you a bit more about that because um, there's a huge theme in your book, uh, and it comes up in a number of different places about sort of politics of narrating Palestinian stories, whether it's the sociologist and his experience of Midhat or uh, Abuna Antoine. And I was curious, like, where did that come from? Did it come from your experience of going there and thinking about the politics of just talking to people and representing their stories? Or did it come from reading these historical sort of orientalizing or documentary sources by European men? Um, yeah, where where was the sort of inspiration for that thread? I think, yeah, I think the, that's well detected. I think it's all of those things um, and uh, the politics of narration, but also the politics of observation and of looking. What does it mean to look and to observe? And in what context um, can that be problematic or um, how does that can intersect with with power, with structures of power? Um, and the book is, you know, it's kind of full of people generalizing about other people, sort of like very human tendency to put other people in boxes. 
um, and to label and categorize, um, which was kind of very in vogue in that period. That's like the beginning of uh, racial theory, beginning of kind of eugenicist ideas, which directly um, correlates to um, kind of the age of empire and basically legitimizing colonial domination over other peoples because they're inferior. So that's, that theme sort of directly features in the book. Um, um, but I kind of wanted to um, explore the uh, both the kind of, I would say, the violence of the problems of, of putting people in boxes um, and of labelling. What does it mean when you want to label yourself? You know, there's kind of the, like, what should we call ourselves? Should we be Syrians? Should we be Palestinians? Um, and, uh, and at the same time, what the what the kind of literal fallout is of those of of, uh, of those kind of categories or um, and so on. I mean, and I guess that does directly that does relate to narration. I do the the French priest. I think was a kind of um, Orientalist figure that sort of he needed to be there. I felt we needed we had a kind of Orientalist presence in the first part in France, and we needed one in Nablus. So a, you know, we have a Palestinian in France, and then we have a Frenchman in Nablus. In the rest of the book, um, and I kind of channeled those the, those ideas sort of through him, and um, I give him a kind of moment of recognition where he understands what he's done wrong, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was definitely a very compelling um, sort of arc in the story, um, and I guess related to that, and this is definitely me projecting again as like a Palestinian American who writes at times about Palestine. Like, did you, it can be a fraught process, the weight of the politics and the history and sort of representation. And so I wonder if you could talk about any anxieties, like writing the novel and what you found the most challenging to narrate. You know, like, I do think that, you know, it was very fortunate that I wrote it kind of in a state of innocence. Like I wrote it yeah. without really knowing how difficult it would be. I didn't know how long it would take me. I was like, almost fresh from undergrad a kind of um and I think that that being young meant that I didn't even know that it would get read I didn't have any of that kind of like pressure of what does it mean to be doing these things it was almost like kind of sort of just for me kind of uh, exploring these ideas so I didn't at the same time having said that I also um and I think that that's where that theme of looking comes from and that theme of narration that theme of kind of uh, power and knowledge comes from is basically consciousness that anytime you're writing about Palestine, it's like immediately politicized and that it's very easy to be misconstrued. I feel like we're all competing with propaganda basically um, because of the, silent, the kind of systematic silencing of the Palestinian narrative or narratives and the Palestinian voices. And that, that um, uh, you just do feel very conscious of when you're, when you're writing about Palestine. You don't, you don't want to be writing in slogans. You don't want to have to constantly be, be take, tearing down propaganda. But if you're writing in English, that's basically what you do have that in your mind. Um, and um, I don't know, they're probably fed into certain choices of episodes I chose um, to illuminate from the history. But I think that also maybe may have been one of the reasons I didn't just focus on Midhat, that it became a story of the struggle more broadly and, given that he's not a very political actor, the kind of his novels also populated by people who are, um, and who do <laughs> take a more kind of direct role in, the, in resisting British rule in science and immigration. Definitely. And I, I think exploring, kind of confronting, at least I as a reader appreciated confronting directly his sort of ambiguous or ambivalent rather relationship with politics, because that also felt very real, um, you know, as a, a sort of a characteristic. Um, and to your point, and something we try to do with the festival is like sort of sh sh sort of challenge the idea that there's one Palestinian narrative that involves being um, a certain type of political, um, a certain type of political activist and sort of move beyond that uh, or just expand upon it. Um, so kind of re related to something you were talking about, which is sort of writing about Palestine in English, I was reading a few reviews online and The Guardian called this book Middle March with Minarets was like in their title and it made me laugh and kind of roll my eyes. But I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the publishing industry, the packaging and sort of the orientalizing that's naturally going to happen. Um, how did you navigate that? Were there any interesting experiences there or like fights you had to fight? Um, yeah. That's very, it's a good question. I don't want to get in trouble. But, um, <laughs> don't get in trouble, yeah. Really it's trouble. on the record. <laughs> I would say there's a marked difference between the um, 
the British and the U the British and the US covers. And I think that mm -hmm. I um, I preferred something that wasn't that didn't have um, an Oriental flavor. Put it that way. Yeah. Um, but I also understand that there's a that there are people who do want that. So yeah. I mean, like a, but I think that there are different ways of going about these things. Um, um, the middle arch of mid minarets. Um, yeah, I think the thing is, is that it is a, it is a kind of, in many ways, it it is like a kind of, cla it's sort of structured like a classic, or like more like an, a Russian novel, I would say, with like lots mm -hmm. of characters and kind of um, bit families and sort of the way in politics and the private spheres intersect. Um, and so I, I understand that reference, although, and, and, and I had studied English literature at university, so I can't deny that I read a lot of classics and stuff, and so yeah. there are those in my head. At the same time, I do think that the 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 style or the kind of realism actually came out of something else. It wasn't it was because I um was so obsessively trying to imagine Palestine before the Nakba that there was this kind of obsession with details and hence the um dedication mm -hmm. to my grandmother for the details. Yeah. Uh, and that 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 I, I wanted to visualize it, you know, so that every, you know, there's a lot of emphasis on interiors and on furniture, on, on, on mm -hmm. like, things like the plumbing or, you know, the kind of, the little sort of extraneous details that aren't really related to the plot, um, which which speak or, or a, and relate to a certain kind of scene setting, which speak to an old fashioned um, realism that might claim, you know, somebody to claim it's like Middlemarch. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but I feel like that, you know, it had more to do with Palestine in a way than it had to do with um, George Eliot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's interesting, and I think, um, and and it's definitely clear that there is some real world building going on, which, at least for me as a reader, I really appreciated. You know, again, these details that you can zoom in on and get a sense of what what this place might have looked like um, before the Nakba, as you say. Um, so I'm going to ask a question. I'm going to read you a short quote from Shireen Saikoli, who's a historian of Palestine of Nablus in the American Historical Review in which she discussed your book. And she says, the Parisian is rich in archival details and brave in its narration of the most intimate of family histories. Hamad is loyal to the canal and Hamad family's angle of vision. The majority of Palestinians, peasants, workers, and servants remain nameless but they begin to appear as glimmers of full personalities at the end of the story. Indeed, it was not until the mid 1930s that Palestinian notables like the Hamad and the nascent middle classes like the Canals would begin to understand peasants, workers and servants as more than objects of reform. And I really liked that because I felt like it was a fair description of something that is more of an observation than a critique, right? Like you have access to the certain segment of Palestinian society um, in, in your family. Uh, and I wonder how much um, class was on your mind in the story and how you sort of were, how you navigated that given your, your interlocutors and the people you were interviewing and the sources that you had. Yeah, it was very much on my mind actually. Um, and, um, but I, I felt that I, um, because I was relying on family narrative, I didn't have access to that those the narrative of those classes. But I was very mm -hmm. conscious that the uprising in the 30s was led by um, the working classes and the uh, and the fellahin. And so there is a I mean, if there's a critique in the novel, it's the critique of the uh, the elites and their stagnating nationalist movement, um, which is kind of fought with infighting and with self interest, which leads to kind of certain kinds of corruption. Um, and then you have this sort of, and it's kind of channeled through the character of the priest who is, uh, you know, he sees um, what he calls Muslim civilization as sort of monolithic and unchanging. And then suddenly there's this, this mobilization of the peasantry and, and they are basically taking charge um, of the uprising. That's what, what kicks things off. So then there's a betrayal at the end of the novel when they, when the leadership who's kind of, classically co-opted the um, mm -hmm. what is a grassroots struggle, call it off and say that there's a victory, although we know what happened after. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so yeah, it was very much on my mind. I mean, it kind of, you know, um, I, uh, they, they kind of peek at the edges. There's also the um, the maid, um, the maid in the cat's family who's, uh, who's gets fired by his grandmother also kind of appears mm -hmm. sort of apparition. Mm -hmm. kind of. So there's sort of the um, reminders of the, of the um, 
the class problems within Navajo society. Yeah. And it's, yeah, and I, I think um, both both in Nablus and in the Molinos household, it's definitely present, you know, these class structures and um, lack of mobility. Uh, and um, and uh, it, so it was it was interesting to read and sort of see some of the the parallels, maybe even in these elite households, um, while there are obviously differences. Uh, and I and I um, I actually. Uh, I want to sort of go back to so the middle March point, and you had you read a lot of English literature in in college, um, and I'm sure growing up. And I wonder if you could talk more about your influences, your literary influences, both in English and Arabic, if you have them, or Arabic in translation. Um, mm. um, I think that um, I mean I read widely. I don't know that there's there are books that I necessarily copied although I did refer frequently to Marquez when I was writing this book for Technique. I also was very, um, I read, I kind of reread and reread Arabesques by Anton Shammas um, as well, just before writing it. Mm -hmm. um, but I, 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 think, I think I kind of used a lot of memoirs, I read a lot of memoirs um, from, of people from Nablus, um, like Sato Tupan and others, and Sahar Khalife for all the novels. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, kind of broad. I don't know that there's necessarily yeah. one or, you know, that I yeah. can find. Um, I think that a lot of the time when you, with the first book especially, it's quite unconscious and the aesthetic choices yeah. are quite, like, you're just sort of teaching yourself how to write and you're piecing it together from whatever you can, whatever's to hand. Yeah. yeah. Did the book, I mean, this is, a, I guess, another question about your process, but did, did the book start with Minhat as a character or Nablus or family history more broadly? It started with Midhat. It started yeah. with the story of him going to France and there being a letter that got sent that got yeah. away. Um, that was the, that was him, yeah. The, yeah. the motivation. Yeah, and then the romance of Far From It and all this, yeah. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to uh, start reading some of our audience questions. So we have one. Um, did you see the Parisian in a particular place in the Palestinian literary tradition? Or do you see the book uh, sort of existing on its own? Um, and That's interesting. Or, I mean, yeah. Yeah. It's in English. So, and I do think, you know, a lot of um, Arabic language, Palestinian canon, if you call it that, is it often has a focus on fragmentation and, um, and uh, um, in some ways a kind of um, certain kinds of, I don't know, Saeed talks about the kind of scene and the sort of brokenness outside of the scene. So to write something that has a kind of a cohesive backbone of a narrative is sort of not totally in keeping with, with the tradition. Um, at the same time, um, I, I kind of wanted to sort of, there was, there was, some, there was some point to that as well and being like pre nakba you know, it's like the pre-dislocation, so that there was sort of a mm -hmm. political making in that sense. Um, but I don't, I mean, I think maybe we could talk about it being in um, uh, Palestinian literature and diaspora. It could be mm -hmm. maybe, um, broadening the linguistically, the kind of linguistic multiplicity of what it means to be making um, art in the name of Palestine. Right. Um, yeah, and I, I think, uh, uh, you know, I was thinking about your book as I read, as I rather, I was thinking of Edward Said as I read your book and something he says about narrating Palestinian experience as really being this process of fragmentation. You have all of these different narratives and holes in your family history that you're trying to fill. And I almost, um, you know, the process of putting it all together can be really Im impossible in some cases. But I think one thing that, you know, hearing about your process, part of it is just putting together this history that we, we have access to, but it's not presented to us in a cohesive manner. And I think because there is so much dislocation, our parents don't live in the houses that their parents lived in, that their parents lived in. We don't have these very straightforward narratives. And so excavating that and putting it together, I was thinking about that as sort of a process of, of writing. And I really, I mean, I see that in your book for sure. Um, uh, so here's actually a question that references Edward Said. Ms. Hamad is clearly influenced with Edward Said's Orientalism and Hegel's theory of philology. 
Um, but she was curious about how these characters were um, applied through the character of the professor. So, uh, as a print, so in I guess I'm in order to understand. I think my the way I understand this question is, yeah. how do you? Um, uh, refer to these people as primitive through the character of the um, through the Europeans who are kind of talking about them without reinforcing these stereotypes or uh, sort of dehumanizing them. I think. How do you extricate yeah, yeah, your views from cool. those you invoke? Yeah, because I gave Mithat the opportunity to fight back. He says yeah. he sees the notes and um, is very offended and says, "How dare you try to humanize me?" Mm -hmm. I am a person, you know, that it's kind of like, and I think I was, I did that partly because I wanted to, um, I, I was taking umbrage of the idea of humanizing, you know, people often talk about like humanizing a narrative or humanizing Palestinians, which is incredibly uh, patronizing. Why should Palestinians have to constantly prove they're humans? Um, so I put it in the novel so that um, we could have Midhat experience that and then argue back and then leave in mm -hmm. outrage. Really, and he's betrayed basically by the woman he loves. He doesn't stand up for him uh, in the face of her father. Um, so you know, it's a novel. I, I because it's a novel with lots of characters in the in the third person narrators that I remove. I'm not expressing a point of view, but you know, through the through the structure of the drama, you can sort of see my point. I think. Right. Definitely. Certainly. Um, uh, so we have another question. Uh, do you use any archives other than your families in your research? for instance, state archives or the Palestinian archives in Beirut. Um, and what was that experience like? Um, I actually didn't use any. I, I, my archival research was quite limited. And I basically, um, I, uh, I read, I, I, there were kind of a few major history books that I read, like um, mm -hmm. there was a history book by um, Ihsan Nimr, um, mm -hmm. uh, about Nablus, which I kind of had a long drama trying to find. Um, uh, the third, the third uh, book in the series, which had mm -hmm. finally found a bit of eight, which is another long drama. Um, but in terms of the archives, it was basically I just did that for um, to, in order to try and get the voice of the British officers who very briefly appear in um, the second part. Um, so I just I went to the war archives in London and tried to get a feeling for their for their voices and the way they talked. Um, so um, yeah, broadly it was history books and um, and uh, oral histories. Yeah. And there are, I mean, there are some, and you reference them in your acknowledgments, some really detailed historical accounts of Palestine in this period, like Ellen Fleischmann's and Bashara Damani. And so there are, that's, um, you know, they've done a lot of that work as well. Um, Annie Gall is asking, uh, the conversation has touched on class, and I'm also curious to hear about the choices around gender and specifically female characters. From the intimate details about how to roll grape leaves to the world of girls' schools and women's political organizing in Jerusalem. Yeah, I guess, you know, that was obviously a, a big interest in, of mine, um, particularly having a grandmother who's a very sort of forceful um, figure in. Um, um, kind of Palestinian struggle, um, and um, I, yeah, I mean, Elaine Fleischman was a great was a great source mm -hmm. for that, um, and um, I, I used the character of um, of uh, Sahar, uh, who's mm -hmm. she's a, she's a mix of a couple of important Palestinian feminists, among them Farah Abdel um, uh, and the northern came, came from Nablus. So it was quite interesting because Nablus is obviously you know, just quite a traditional town, pretty conservative, and yet they also produce these quite strong um, female figures uh, and thinking about how that also intersected with class dynamics and the development of the uprising in the 30s was also, I think, something I just wanted to explore and um, dramatise. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I guess, uh, um, oh, wow, we have a lot of good questions. Okay, um, and I think one thing that, uh, I guess that question, before I go on to our audience questions, that sort of, as a historian, um, I'm wondering as a novelist, like in doing this research, was there something specific that you learned? I'm sure you learned a lot, but is there something specific that an account you can remember that surprised you, a detail or a 
a reference or an event, uh, and you're like, I have to include this in the novel, um, or just something you learned that that you want to share with us. Um, well, let me think. <laughs> I mean, I was like quite obsessed about the architecture. I mean, I, 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 mm-hmm. I talked a lot with architects. Um, I don't know. I think that's a Palestinian so obsession. I, you know, yeah, I mean, I I was rereading the novel. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was rereading the novel to prepare for this this talk, and one of the one of the moments that I really loved, which I just gl- like glossed over the first time I read it, was um, when Sahed goes to her husband's house for the first time in this whole like interlude with the tiles and trying to find the architect who designed the house and trace where the tiles came from, and then she goes back to the house, and then you sort of get into the women's movement through these tiles, like the women all gather on these tiles. Um, well, like, where did that detail come from? Can't remember. I mean, I think that <laughs> also I can't. Sometimes, like, you know, you put things in and then you can't remember if you made yeah. them up or real. I'd be, I'd, uh, yeah. But I, uh, the tiles. I mean, obviously, the t- tiles are kind of fantastic. Um, mm-hmm. and, um, I I do remember. You know, I did do quite a lot of research about the earthquake. I was quite interested in the way the earthquake figured in people's mm-hmm. memories. Um, and there was this story from that my grandmother told me that. Fatima, her mother, had seen the sky that the when the earthquake hit Nablus, the the, the building kind of opened and she saw the sky and it closed again. So I guess that kind of was where the tile thing came yeah. from. Yeah, really. I, I forgive me, I can't remember if it was no, true. It was totally I doubt right. it was true. I think I probably made that up. But yeah, that's an interesting <laughs> answer in and of itself. But um, right. it was so there was like such yeah, um, yeah detail there. Um, <laughs> So uh, we have another question. Um, So something you've been talking about, but to maybe expand on the process of writing your first novel and translating intimate oral histories into a novel of such breadth and depth. So like how long did the process take? How involved was your family in reading drafts or giving feedback? Um, Um, Well, it was, the whole thing took me about five years in total. uh, And that was, uh, quite a little, you know, kind of chaotic. I, you know, it wasn't like I did the research and then I wrote. I sort of was constantly yeah. doing it, constantly new questions were arising. I was trying to answer them, um, and the structure of the novel was uh, was sort of changing as I went along. Um, but I, I mean, I, I'm afraid I'm not going to give a very adequate answer because I feel like it's a very unconscious process, and I'm quite a chaotic researcher. Um, and um, uh, yeah, I think that that what I mean, what I've just told you, told you where I could yeah. see what I made up and what was real. I mean, sometimes I would look about things like, oh, great, that's so very inventive. <laughs> and then I'd realize it was all true. <laughs> um, yeah. But um, I, I did, uh, my, my, my parents read it, my, um, and uh, my father, you know, we speak every Sunday and he would um, give me ideas or, you know, they weren't always that helpful, but there was one, you know, he was really became quite obsessed with me putting in something about the Zeppelin because, you know, the Germans flew, flew the Zeppelin over um, Jerusalem in, uh, they flew it twice, once was 27, I think once was 31. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, he really wanted me to put in something about the Zeppelin, but it didn't quite fit in with my timeline. So I was like, you know, Bob, I'm sorry, I can't really, I'm not doing that to 31 or whatever your beer was. He kept sending me emails with links to images of the Zeppelin. Eventually, I put it in as a, as a flashback that a character has a flashback about the Zeppelin. So it's like, <laughs> a bit about the Zeppelin. That's great. Um, and then maybe you know, this question prompted me to, to think of another question, which is uh, have, have you heard from your family since reading the novel or any of, since publishing the novel or any of the people that you interviewed back in Nablus? Have they read it? Um, what, what's their reception been? Like, yeah, it's been great actually. I mean, it's like um, I think um, it's been really it's been really a special thing. I think I think I, I did get in trouble with with for changing the family tree, but you know, there's so many family members. I kind of had to be in, you know take some creative license, um, and and that would be like no, but you changed them. This is my cousin. <laughs> um, but broadly, it's been really lovely. I had it in March just before lockdown. I was in Amman and I did an event at the um, Columbia Global Center there. And there were lots of relatives who'd come who I'd never met before, who had all these other stories about him as well, which is kind of amazing. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, so then to like zoom out of the novel, um, because we're the DC Palestinian Film and Arts Festival, uh, and we're interested in sort of Palestinian subjectivities, obviously. Uh, 
Can you talk a little bit more about your experience of being Palestinian growing up and your experiences with Palestine, um, especially before you, you visited? Yeah. I mean, I think it's quite, you know, when you grow up and you don't go, you have these, um, uh, you have this conception of Palestine that's a kind of, it's kind of abstract in a way. And it's quite kind of, uh, we were, you know, I was, I was politicized uh, young as a result. And I, um, very much I set out to write this book with quite a strong political intention to write about Palestine before the Nakba, um, but without the material experience of going and being there. And that is kind of, I think that's also quite interesting in a way that you have this, uh, it has to do with, our, it's almost, Palestine is more than a place, like it has to do with our families and it has to do with all sorts of very private things and also to do with a certain uh, model of political liberation or vision of political liberation. Um, and uh, so I think that, Although it's quite hard for me now to, it's almost quite hard for me to remember what it was like before I went in a sense to have to get back to that slight abstraction. Um, uh, although I'd obviously, you know, I spent time in Lebanon and Jordan, so it wasn't, you know, mm -hmm. still about what it's going to be like, but it's, it's very different. So. Um, and uh, so I do think that in a way, although this is a zoom out question to talk, refer back to the book, the book was a, also a kind of growing up or kind of growing, in, growing into in a sense for me. A learning, really big learning experience from doing that research. Mm -hmm. Certainly. Um, and then back to the book, I mean, food is such a part of it too, and details about food. And I think one of our commenters mentioned the, the rolling of the grape leaves. And so at least in my own experience, that's something that long before I went to Palestine, it like was a place where it existed, was like in our, in our cuisine, I guess. Um, yeah. Um, and I have to ask you actually, because we've been asking our audiences this, um, and Nablus has the best on, on social media and Nablus has the best Knesset. Um, so are you a partisan? Do you prefer the name or the, the soft or the, the crunchy? I love <laughs> name. Really? Oh man, we'll have to agree to disagree on that. Um, <laughs> so can you tell us a little bit, oh, we have more questions, um, and okay, I will go on to our audience questions, and the themes of madness and mental health recur throughout the book, notably in the first section, when Midhat attempts to diagnose what caused Jeanette's mother to kill herself, spoiler, um, and in the last section, when he himself ends up in a ward after discovering Jeanette's letter, um, that his father has hid from him. Was there a metaphorical significance to these episodes or that general invocation of madness throughout the book beyond these specific plot points? So, yeah. Um, it wasn't like, I um, wouldn't say that it has metaphorical significance, but it does, it feeds into that thing about kind of uh, categorizations um, and also um, a, the politics of looking and observing. So, um, there is actually, you know, these episodes of mental illness or kind of um, uh, troubled mental states are also quite reasonable. I, I kind of, they're not actually um, outsized responses to the reality in which the person was living, uh, and but they're classed as abnormalities or irregularities. And I think that I just, I, maybe I was just interested in that idea in general. I also was conscious that Midhat was a very sensitive person and had suffered um, and I was interested in why you know what was it about the situation that was provoked was that was um, provoking such a, a troubled psychological response in him because in many ways it's almost kind of a psychological portrait as well of him mm -hmm. as somebody who experiences that he can't um, uh, he can't integrate and they're in different languages and you know he can't find a way to give a narrative to the two parts of himself um, but in the relation to the to Jeanette's mother in the first part, that's there's this, I guess I was trying I was sort of there was lots of overlapping um, uh, you know subject and object relations there where Midhat is sort of you know observing the mother as a doctor looking at her so as a patient and all these ways in which um, power interplayed with categorizations in medical and medical realms actually. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, that totally makes sense. And there's something um, you know in the sort of literature of this period, uh, the, like the, the academic work being done now. I mean, a lot of, there's this new attention to medicine um, as a form of 
classification uh, as in the same way as all of these other kind of racial categories, this sort of urge to um, really diagnose and classify and typify people and how that might not really translate to experience. Um, and so I think, you know, I hadn't thought about it until, until you were just discussing this question, but there is this sort of relationship between the medical literature and the medicalization of all of these experiences. And then also what Antoine is doing and what the sociologist is doing, like this broader way of thinking about people. And um, so that is, yeah. that is cool. In the hospital as a space, I thought also I found quite yeah. interesting what can happen in the hospital space where you have people different classes mixing. Um, and mm -hmm. that was the case where the priest who I based the character of Antoine on did get his material. He would go to Oh really, hospital. yeah because that was a space where they were kind of free to talk in a way. Right. That was interesting. That is interesting. Um, so we have one another more question. Um, so there have been criticisms of the book in that Medhat Kamal's uh, mind was colonized in parallel ways of how Palestine was colonized at the time by the British and Zionists. Uh, so I'll ask if you kind of agree with that, that reading, and then also was it done on purpose? Now his mind was colonized. I mean, I wouldn't, I think that, you know, um, I think that uh, he does kind of decolonize himself at the end, that does occur. Um, I feel like it's not as straightforward as saying that France or his experience of France was entirely bad because he does fall in love there and he is loved back. But it's deeply complicated by the fact that France is a colonial power and it's colonizing apart from the Middle East. Um, but there is a kind of way in which he basically is colonized in a sense by Orientalist images of Arabs. He kind of doesn't know how to attach himself. So having shrugged off this um, deeply insulting attempt by his host to humanize him, he then kind of, uh, you know, he's a young man trying to find himself. You know, he's sort of like highly performative and um, uh, very deeply uncomfortable in his skin. As I sort of like in that first reading I gave, you kind of get a sense of that. He's kind of trying to find himself. Um, and uh, when he goes to Paris, he basically just like adopts these, this performative, um, uh, you know, sort of orientalized Arab mode. Mm -hmm. So that, there is a kind of way in which that is, that, that kind of continues and that in a way it's a sort of almost like a psychological, like a neurotic manifestation of this yeah. trauma in France, it's this, this performative. Um, so that, that part actually made me wonder if you'd read before or if that was at all influenced or just like coincidental parallel with Seasons of Migration to the North, um, the Sudanese novel uh, by Taya <laughs> Bissala. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I forgot to mention that. Yeah, yeah, very much. Because, yeah, and so there's something there that is almost like complicating the idea of whether it's, you know, if he's like, like you're saying, like sort of performing this or wearing it or putting it on and using it to his advantage, then um, it's not such a passive act of sort of being colonized as much of a sort of, um, there's more agency there, I guess, is part of yeah. the point of that novel as well. But. Right, and I kind of, I try to draw that a little bit with the Samaritans where um, he comes, he accidentally encounters a Samaritan priest dying uh, some parchment basically to sell to um, Orientalists. So this is mm -hmm. sort of way in which right. they're, they're like pandering to the market and actually he perceives, whereas like they're very ashamed, they're like, you shouldn't have seen this. Mm -hmm. Mithat recognizes something. He's like, oh, you can, you know, that they, there is some agency in kind of making right. your own image or like taking control and using it to your own ends, I think. Right, there's something empowering about that. Um, I remember that scene. Uh, okay, we have two minutes, but can you tell us quickly a little bit about what your newer project is? Sure. Um, it's uh, well. I mean, I'm kind of in the middle of it. I thought, like, yeah. So uh, only as much as you uh, can so share. It's about women mainly. It's about three women uh, and their relationships to each other. Um, and it's about a play that gets put on in the West Bank. Um, so okay. we'll have to have you back to talk about that um, whenever you're finished. Um, well, thank you uh, so much. We're, we're out of time um, and there are no more questions. So I just want to thank you again for joining us and for um, sharing all of these details and thoughts about the process of writing and your experience um, of the novel. I, I want to make a plug to those of you tuning in to, um, to 
show up to our documentary this evening, Ibrahim, as well as our DJ set afterwards. We have a packed day of programming and you can find it all on our website cctpath.org. Um, and once again, shout out um, to Isabella for joining us from Athens and, um, and and giving us your time. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you for tuning in.